Hello and welcome to a Useful Idiots Breaking-ish News Disclaimer Explainer. As you'll soon see on this very episode, Matt and I discuss Biden's pledge to relax intellectual property rules to distribute COVID-19. Now, when we recorded this episode, he had not yet announced his new position. In fact, he had only dragged his feet. Now, as I predict on the episode, if Biden wound up doing the right thing, we would know that it was in part because of useful idiots because we kept this story in our sights. Okay, but jokes aside, here is what happened shortly after we recorded our episode. U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai said in a press release, This is a global health crisis, and the extraordinary circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic call for extraordinary measures. The administration believes strongly in intellectual property protections, but in service of ending this pandemic, supports the waiver of those protections for COVID-19 vaccines. Now, I'm going to turn to friend of the show, David Sirota, who wrote a great piece at Daily Poster. He co-wrote it with Walker Bragman and Andrew Perez. And here's what the three of them say at Daily Poster. The declaration was widely hailed by public interest groups who feared the administration would follow the past precedent and oppose any emergency action on patents. However, Ty's statement was narrow. It only mentioned COVID vaccines and avoided endorsing an existing broad waiver proposed by India and South Africa, which could cover diagnostic kits, vaccines, medicines, personal protective equipment, and ventilators. Her statement also preemptively warned that the, quote, negotiations will take time given the consensus-based nature of the institution and the complexity of the issues involved, end quote, a process that could provide drug makers an opening to try to limit a final waiver. So, guys, as with everything, we got to remain skeptical. So it's kind of good news. It's definitely a step in the right direction, but we got to keep them honest. So we're going to keep covering this and we're going to get into next week what the actual details of the waiver are. All right. Welcome to Useful Idiots. I'm Matt Taibbi. And I'm Katie Halper. Did you have anything interesting happen to you this week? Not really. I got kind of annoyed with someone, but that's about it. Was it me? Well, yeah, of course, but that's not interesting. Why is that week? Uh, why is this week different from every other week? Right. No, a friend. Why, why is this above all this week different than? Right? Yeah. That's from the Bible somewhere. Isn't it's it? uh, from the Passover seder. Right, have you right. ever been to a seder? I have been to a seder. Nice. Yes. Some some of my best friends are Jewish. Oh, nice. You should come yeah. uh, next year to my family seder. Ah, okay, sure. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. My mom just, really just wants you probably. and your family to visit. Okay. All right. Well, she'll regret that. But I'm sure. Yeah. I had a beaver eat my porch. What? Yeah. Did you get? Please tell me you got photos of the beaver. Uh, I did. Um, I think I do have some photos of the beaver somewhere. Yeah, but are um, they cute? Is it cute? A cute one? So it, it was. It was cute, but I. I it quickly became an unsympathetic character. Beaver. So yeah, I, I was on my way home, and we have a little stair that goes down on the way to our front door, and my son pointed and said. Daddy, what's that? And I thought he was pointing to a pile of pollen on the stairwell. And I said, oh, it's pollen. That's what happens in trees in the, in the spring. And he goes, no, what's that? And like farther down, there was a there was a beaver whose head was stuck <gasps> in, this, in this side of a stairwell. It's hard to explain what it was. He had somehow gotten his head stuck in there. And I was really worried because I thought, you know, he's going to get his head stuck. And he's going to die there, right? I mean, I, I didn't, didn't want that to happen. And I went into another entrance of the house and we were looking at it by the time i got around to looking at it again it had chewed through basically like the half the structure that it had uh, to yeah so there was just this carnage everywhere and then and it just couldn't it couldn't get out of where it was so <gasps> oh, it despite was just look- eating it yeah yeah it was That's it important. was a mess yeah so what did you do how did you liberate it i threw a bucket of water in front of him and he freaked out and sort of jumped jumped off the uh the landing there like so you threw would... the water like you threw the water from a bucket and you didn't throw an actual bucket full of water no 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 i threw right. a water, bucket of water at his feet just to freak him out so that is showing us that necessity is indeed the mother of invention it, yeah i mean right? he, he he had to he had to eat his way out of the situation it was it was impressive actually i mean i, I was kind of I was rooting for him to figure it out, but he, you know, I, mentally I was calculating how much that was going to cost and 
contracting the whole time it was, right. <laughs> it was happening. So right. Do you have was, beaver uh, insurance? I do not have beaver insurance. I don't, know, I, don't know, I don't know. I don't know how common that is actually. Beaver insurance. Well, Maybe that should be a Geico product that they offer. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, so it's interesting that he tried to eat his way out and then couldn't. But then mm. when I guess it was like what it ratcheted up his survival instincts. Yeah, and then he he just had a kind of a fight or flight mechanism. Right. Really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A fight so. or 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 chew. Right. Yep. Yep. He was cute. I mean, he had the whole you know teeth and everything, and uh, uh, I would hope know. so, or else he'd really be would have really been screwed. Yeah, I have I have a lot of wildlife around my house, but that was the that was the first beaver we've had on. Yeah, the house, so. show a photo. We'll have to see. We'll, we'll have, have to, to put yeah, it I'll, put I'll, it in. I'll post it. So that happened. So we survived the beaver attack. All right. So stuff happened this week. A lot of stuff uh, happened. Yeah, a lot, lot of stuff happened. Well, I guess we'll just sort of plunge into it, right? Yeah. So, so you're up first with uh, Democrats. Yeah, suck. Democrats suck. OK, so um, we got let's take a look at uh, at something that Joe Biden told activist Addie Barkin, who is someone who suffers from ALS. He's a really great activist, uh, social justice activist, and is actually at the uh, Center for Popular Democracy and then has turned into a, a healthcare activist because of his having ALS. So this is from the summer. If we could just watch this first clip of Biden talking to Addie Barkham. If the U.S. discovers a vaccine first, will you commit to sharing that technology with other countries? And will you ensure there are no patents to stand in the way of other countries and companies mass producing those life-saving vaccines? Absolutely, positively. This is the only humane thing in the world to do. <laughs> Absolutely, one hundred percent not guilty. Yeah, seriously. Gotta get that OJ OJ esque conviction. Yeah. So now let's fast forward to uh, today. Let's look at this tweet from Addie Barkin. Dear President Biden, I want to remind you of a promise you made to me and to the American people. If the U.S. discovers a vaccine first. Will you commit to sharing that technology with other countries? And will you ensure there are no patents to stand in the way of other countries and companies mass producing those life-saving vaccines? Absolutely, positively. This is the only humane thing in the world to do. Mr. President, you and I are both safe from this deadly pandemic because we could get the vaccine. And we will stay safe if you reverse Trump's inhumane policies and we vaccinate the entire world. That is the only way that we can prevent the development of vaccine-resistant coronavirus variants. But billions of families around the world aren't as lucky as you and me. India's being engulfed by this virus, and its people are utterly helpless. Coming. Mass cremations and funeral pyres now lighting. The India has set a global record for daily infections and Indians deaths. are being abandoned in the teeth of a deadly disease. I, I think I think the the film of films of the funeral pyre, pyres are that, fake. Well, they're not fake. I'm just it's, kidding. It, it's just a little. It's a little bit of a cultural issue there because what that's how that's that's a normal ceremony in, well in, but they're running of out of wood i, I wonder I, how, I mean i know there are ceremonies that do that like that's a right i'm how not many... saying there's not a lot of victims i'm just saying that they played up that angle as though it's oh my god it's so it's so extreme right. they're, doing, they're burning bodies but they they would anyway right but i don't think in a but like heaps of them maybe not heaps but like they're mass cremations they're not like one-on-one -on -one cremations right yeah so that's yeah Still think there's a little, yeah, anyway. If any American leader of our lifetime has understood the value of a single life and the deep pain of loss, it is you. Ooh. But you also know the beauty of salvation. You know the joys that life can bring. When I asked you last year if you would change the global rules for vaccines, you did not hesitate, equivocate, or mince your words. The answer is yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And it's not only a good thing to do, it's overwhelmingly in our interest to do it as well. May 5th will be your moment, America's moment, to steer us down a more just and humane path. Governments from around the globe will gather at the World Trade Organization. They will ask America to waive the rules that are blocking them from making enough vaccines to protect their people. In this pandemic, millions of families around the world are grieving because of one stray cough, one brief mistake, one unfortunate moment. American innovation has delivered health and safety to the people of this country. 
but billions of people have been excluded. Their dreams are no less real than ours, their love is no less strong, their lives are no less worthy. But because they live somewhere else, because they have less money, because the international laws are unfair, and because the pharmaceutical companies are so greedy, millions more people may die of this disease. You know that this is wrong. You know it in the marrow of your bones. In a few days, at the WDO meeting, all eyes will be on America. We will decide the answer to the world's plague. What kind of leadership will we display? The answer, Mr. President, I like is up the, to you. Uh, the sort of movie trailer. Yeah. M music. Yeah, it is good. Yeah. So that's from the organization the More Perfect Union. You know, he does something in that Addy Barkin. He refers to Biden's um, personal loss and grief which some people find tacky, but I think it's totally appropriate. It's like, to me, it's, it's, it's like the same thing when, when you talk about gun policy after a mass shooting and people are like, don't politicize. It's like, of course, this is a question of life and death. And same thing with this. And it's not like Biden is private about the tragedies he's undergone. In yeah, fact, I mean, he's, he, he's, he's been going there for 30, yeah, 30 40 yeah, years. So. Yeah, and he tries to link it to his Medicare, his, well, his healthcare position, which of course is anti-Medicare for all. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's not, I, I've always had a problem with that, like weaponizing grief to deny other people life saving treatment. That's my take. And I'm sticking to it. You know, I guess I guess my take is different. I, I, my, my feeling is that uh, you're pro resistant. Uh, I, I think the president resistance. of the United States has to be able to lie to the face of people with severe disabilities. Like, you're I think right. that, like if if you if can't we lose do that, that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? In a crisis. We're gonna uh, are we gonna have that person falter and maybe have an attack of conscience when he when right. the, when the job is to deliver that lie crisply and believably? That's actually a very good point. That's a right? really good point. Yeah, because basically in times of crisis you need normalcy, and the normalcy and the status quo, especially for Biden, is going to be lying to the American public. Right. And anything and less than that is. I want to see an even keel for that. Yeah. Like yeah. I mean I. I, I it would be better if the person who was asking the question was dying of COVID because yeah. that would show like real commitment, right? Matt, why don't you direct your own commercial? My own public service commercial? Yeah. Yes. You could pretend. Absolutely. I will make vaccines available. I will I will make sure that there are Positively. no patent issues. We will have patent waivers. And this is never what's happening. That awful thing that's happening to you right now is not going to happen to millions of other people. You right. Can, you can count on me that. Yeah, it's really disgusting. Okay, I guess I should admit that, like, for a brief moment there, I thought it was possible that they might do it. Do the right thing. Do, do, like, do the patent waivers, but right. well, they they may do it today. I mean, if they if they do do it, then you know, Mazel Tov, and that's well. If they good. do do it, it's going to be because of this, because of our focusing on on the show, oh. which we have been doing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, we brought this up back in the day uh, when we talked about the Perrine piece. So, I don't think they're going to do it, though, because the, yeah. both parties are just swimming in pharma money. And, and right. you know, this, this this would be, I think, a bridge too far for, for the pharma companies. I don't, I don't think they had There's no way that they can swallow this. That bitter pill. Yeah, that bitter that that bitter federally subsidized pill. I don't, yeah. I don't think they can do it. Yeah. Well, then but, they but, need but to. Yeah. Good, good on you to, to Biden to, to show to show the political skill. He, he is actually good at that. I will give at him lying. That. Well, yeah, no, he sells it like he he sells it like he's not saying something controversial, like it, it's come, you know, that it's coming from his like, you know, pancreas or something like that. Like he he with Obama when Obama delivered a line you know, that he had thought through, it was some carefully worked out position between right and wrong. You know, he, he was really good at those things that were right. like, um, and and you knew that he he was leaving himself an out to to maybe shift the 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 position later on right. biden just goes ahead and he just he just sells it you know what i mean he swings through the fences every time yeah he does is, yeah which is a great impressive. contrast because he just doesn't yeah i mean again it's like i can't blame him remember those debates where he just lied and lied and lied and lied and no one said anything yeah well, like I mean, so why not yeah. yeah yeah but not everyone look as we as we i don't know if we mentioned it right but the washington post got rid of its fact checking segment mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. feature when when you know, Biden came to power because, you know, the narrative is he doesn't lie. Trump did. Obviously, we should have a Biden lieometer.
That's actually a really important feature that we should do. So you and I talked about this. We tweeted about this. But the, the, the I thought that column had gotten absurd over the course of Trump's presidency. Like if you if you look at the at the way uh, the 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 frequency with which they did checks on Trump, yeah, they were they were pretty annually doubling the rate of checks. He had more statements that they deemed untrue in the last year of his presidency than all the previous years combined. Right. Which you know, I, means one of two things: either he lied publicly more in that last year, and he lied more in twenty than he did in nineteen, and then more in nineteen than he did in eighteen, more in eighteen than he did in in, uh, in seventeen, or they were just increasing the frequency of checks, right? Because right. that that was a popular thing that they were doing, and they were they were just sort of they were wildly expanding the the, the purview of stuff that you could have called a misstatement by Trump. They started bringing in. Bring in things that, you know, that had been said by his family members. Yeah. You know, if Ivanka created X number of jobs and they would say, well, that's not true because of this, this and this. And so they were, they were really, I think, not that Trump doesn't lie all the time, but they were they were going out of their way to try to make that yeah. column as huge as, as possible. Right. There was no way they were going to do that with Biden. So I. Yeah, you know. that's I mean, that's the thing is like what the the problem I have with it is that it suggests that other people don't lie. It suggests mm. that like, you know, it's and that's that's kind of my problem with the Twitter, you know, notifications, uh, you know, check the facts about this thing is that it, as important as the like what it says about Trump or the overreach or the censorship angle or the content moderation angle is the like by contrast or by what is it process well, right. of elimination there's, it there's makes an, the other stuff true right they're 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 implicitly right yes, endor endorsing it. the content that comes from everybody else when when they when they send you a flag for something that was said by trump or pompeo or mike flynn or whatever it is right and and of course right. there are there are, mis there are misstatements and untruths that come from those people but when they don't do it for adam schiff who right. has who has i i think probably as bad a record of of saying provably false things than any politician not named Donald Trump in the last four years, you know, when they don't do that, it, it just, it makes the whole thing ridiculous. So. Right. Yeah. You're implicitly giving a truth stamp of approval to things that don't deserve it. Right. And then people let it, you know, then people let down their guards. So like, if you're going to have a fact checking thing for Trump, then have one for Biden. You can't just, especially because it, the fact that someone lies less ostensibly doesn't mean that we sh shouldn't keep track of the lies, right? Like, right? Yeah, it's not a contest. Yeah. Oh, and know. that is the most annoying thing. Like, the but, but what Trump. about derp? Yeah, I know. Oh, it's I know. so annoying. I tweeted this thing out about Biden. I was so upset. I don't usually like curse that much, but I was like, I don't remember. If there was a fucking in there, which I don't usually do. Uh, I try to keep it, you know more uh my keep decorum it mm -hmm. keep it pg on twitter but i was just so angry when i saw that that video of him saying positively absolutely um and of course pointing out making the very good point that this is a question of self-interest not just well he says it's, it's very popular but the other thing is that you know it makes sense if just for selfish reasons we should be doing this mm -hmm. when i tweeted that like the responses to it were just incredible it was like how many and i said like I, I said something about how he was lying and people's responses were like, how many times did Trump lie? Uh, I don't know, a lot. Yeah, and, a lot. And, 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 and <laughs> like, you know, I, I don't like Biden. I criticize him. But like, if you like him, just be like, please do the right thing that you promised to do. You don't have to call him a pathological liar. You can like appeal to his ego instead of assigning him like I do. That's totally acceptable. But yeah, it's just, it's like infuriating to watch. That's that's the, the response. Like that's the response we're talking about. Oh yeah, I wrote, holy fucking shit. Can this be the one time Biden's defenders put actual human lives over covering for his lies? It's literal life and death. Anyone who claimed that Trump was a liar monster, he was, should be mad as hell. And then yeah, I get the, but Trump, divisive. Yeah, they call you a MAGA person and yeah. all that stuff. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. You know, there's nothing you can do. And, and, and with Biden also, there's the additional factor of a, a lot of the media people especially take this tack that, oh, well, he's not really lying. He's just kind of confused or he's taking a position that he thinks is necessary to to help Democrats win. The numerous ridiculous positions he took on, on Iraq during just even the last campaign. Right. 
they just let all that stuff slide because you know, oh, at the time people felt this way and that way about the Iraq war. And, you know, he had to show that Democrats were tough and blah, blah, blah. Well, no, actually, he just kind of lied about it. I mean, right. what, yeah, he's not confused. He's not doing something that's that, you know, is politically astute. He's just right. trying to get trying to get out from under criticism that he lied about the Iraq war. So. Right. And I just think that everyone, you know, Chris Coons, you know, uh, Biden's good friend from the Delaware senator is uh has been seen saying that you know it just can't happen you can't waive the patent rights because it'll be bad for the world and bad for the economy and i just think that he should prick himself with covid <laughs> then he has every right to say that but he should he, he should he's just a prick who should get the get a prick the, oh can we can we make that up a prick prick <laughs> it's not a little dad humorish it's not quite as funny as you i'd like it to COVID be prick. but yeah, yeah. Get the COVID, COVID pricks for COVID pricks. Right. Yeah. There's a t-shirt template that would fit there. I just can't remember what it is exactly, but yeah. we'll, we'll have to figure it out. Yeah. And this is a, a clip of uh, Chris Coons, who is, again, he introduced Biden uh, at the DNC. Remember? Mm -hmm. He presented him. But this is a pretty telling uh, clip. January 6th was a moment that was challenging, divisive, difficult for all of us here in Congress. And it was a wake-up call that our country is badly divided. And the ways in which China has become a peer competitor in investing in R&D, in the number of patents issued, the number of research papers published, and the ways in which they are now trying to take the lead in standard essential, um, standard setting bodies. Um, that recent campaign uh, to put a Chinese national at the head of the WIPO, uh, where the PTO director, Andre Yanku, was, um, did yeoman's work to make sure that someone committed to a strong intellectual property system globally instead became the head of the WIPO. All of this is a wake-up call for us that we need to have another Sputnik-like moment of reinvestment in American innovation and competitiveness. A central part of being successful in this competition is continuing with our constitutionally created protected, privacy, protected property right of a patent, something I've long believed in, and I look forward to hearing how you're contributing to working to strengthen and sustain a competitive, strong global IP system, both here in the United States and around. He literally invoked the January 6th insurrection. The logic is, well, look, America's really divided right now. And the only way that we can become united is if we become like a global leader when it comes to manufacturing. So let's definitely start during a pandemic with the COVID vaccines. Now is the time to draw the line. Now is the time where we need to be a global leader again. In other words, I don't care yeah. if people in India and around the globe are dying so long as the United States is united. Anyway, it's really, I mean, it's just, it's really ridiculous, I think, you know, framing it, it also so, as a, a war so, with China is yeah. just embarrassing. So, okay, January 6th happened, we're divided, China is a competitor, we need Sputnik. And we're only way to get Sputnik is if we have patent rights so that the pharma companies can make profits on the COVID vaccines and other countries can't make generics. That makes sense. Yeah, think, that makes I, total I, sense. Yeah, I think I think you could you could. Yeah, that's infallible. That stuff that. Yeah. And that's how we're going to defeat it's, it's, it's China. It's Euclidean in, yeah. in, its in its simplicity. Yeah. And and mm -hmm. also because it will fail to stop because it makes us more vulnerable to, you know, new strains uh, of COVID, mutant strains of COVID. That's another way we're going to beat China somehow, because when more people die around the world, that's showing we're boss. Yeah, that's it. When more people die because we don't waive the patents, that'll show American exceptionalism and American might. We truly are the world's policemen. You know, what would be really unifying. What? Is if we get we get herd immunity here in the United States, and we're all basically not getting the disease anymore, and we just have like a group Zoom call where we Zoom all the other countries in the world, and they're all like choking on their own vomitus and stuff like right. that, and we just sort of wave at them. Right. Uh, you know, we hey, don't wave I, the patent, but we wave hello. Yeah, we wave hello. Hey, it's it, we heard you're all dying in piles of, uh, of COVID. Yeah, we're we're not, you know, that, that'll that'll be a unifying moment, kind of kind of like the Apollo 11 mission, I think. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's a, yeah, it's apartheid. It's a vaccine apartheid Apollo. Right. Well, you're 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 making a joke. You're making you're talking about it. This is as if it's a negative. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. 
<laughs> I'm asking you to, to suspend your disbelief. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You got to lean into it a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, so can I show you Republicans yeah. suck? Yeah. Okay, we, so we, they we, fucking we, suck. Sorry. I'm so yeah. annoyed by them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're bad. Well, look, the, 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 the vaccine, well, we'll see how it turns out. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And also just again, like you would not, people who are mad would be rightly mad at Trump over this and be like, we're talking about lives, human lives. How can you be so callous? How can you be such a sadist? But when Biden does it, like silence. And yeah, again, it's... he's president. You don't have to tiptoe. He's president. Like he's there's nothing you have to do. You don't have to protect him. He's the president. He won. He's the guy who beat the socialist. He won. So I mean, just I, I, pressure him to do the I right thing. They, they would have been. I, I thought it would even have been bigger when when we held out the free vaccines as a negotiating tool with Mexico to try to oh, yeah. get them to send more people on their Guatemalan border. Like if Trump had done that, we'd still be hearing about it. Yeah, I think. totally. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, all right. So I have a pretty brief Republican suck. It's going to, it's going to re resuscitate a, a figure from memory. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Let's uh, Matt, if we could see the uh, Rick Santorum video. Love this guy. It's been too long. And for those of you who don't know. Oh yeah. I always forget. What is Santorum again? It's it's Dan Savage came up with it, right? The it's definition. Like, it's it's like the it's like the gunk between your your, your nuts on. and Let's your see. anus, right? Oh my god. I don't I don't know. And if it's something very different from that, it's gonna be weird. After he made widely publicized homophobic remarks, notably comparing homosexuality to bestiality, the term Santorum was invented and spread as an ironic slang term, referring to a mixture of lube and fecal matter. Ugh, mm -hmm. That can result from anal sex mm -hmm. the pillory him. And uh, that's what it is. I forgot. Yeah. 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 That's good. Oh my God. That's good. It was so, Dan Savage. Yeah. Who came up Dan with Savage, that? Yeah. That, yeah. Was, that, that was good. And, and it actually, it stuck, uh, so to speak. Much. Yeah. Much <laughs> like that thing. Apparently yeah. he accepted yeah. Savage accepted more than 3000 suggestions from readers and posted the most popular for public voting, eventually setting on that frothy quote, that frothy miss sure of lube and fecal matter that is sometimes the byproduct of anal sex and quote, Oh, this Probably. is funny. The Italian surname Santorum is hilariously enough. I'm reading from dictionary.com is hilariously enough said to be from the Latin sanctorum or holy. All right. So can we see the uh, the video? If you think about the story this one. country, I don't know of any other country in the world that was settled predominantly by people who were coming to practice their faith. They came here because they were not allowed to practice their particular faith in their own country. And so they came here mostly from Europe and they set up a country that was based on Judeo-Christian principles. I spelled principles wrong. I like that, but... Oh, and the teachings oh, yeah. of Jesus Christ. That's what our founding documents are based upon. Documents. It's in our DNA. We came here and created a blank slate. We, we birthed a nation. What does that from mean, nothing. Blank? I mean, there's nothing here. I mean, yes, no, we have Native Americans, but, if, but candidly, that, that, there isn't much Native candidly. American culture in American culture. It, it was born of That's pretty good. the people who came here pursuing religious liberty to practice their faith, to live as they ought to live. There isn't much Native American culture in American culture. Is that because we massacred them? Probably, Maybe. yeah. There might, there might be, be a little, little yeah. bit of that. Um, yeah, a, little, a pinch you know, of that. Yeah, there is. A lot Native of our American states culture. are named after Native American words. Right. Um, yeah, we have a, there, there's tons of Native American words in our language, but it's just uh, not it's celebrated as part of American culture. I mean, right. I mean, it's it's less obviously it's less like um, dominant than it would be had there not been a genocide well, against them. Yeah. But it also, you know, to the ex it also does exist, but not surprisingly, Rick Santorum is not interested in them. There isn't much Native American culture in American culture is is a pretty funny, it's pretty amazing, yeah, pretty pretty. It's a pretty tone deaf thing to say about a place where we had to forcibly put people into the reservations right. and rip them off from all their property, right. and I, yeah. I think that's. That's uh, that's pretty amusing, and then also obviously, the, you know, there there is a Native American culture in, in American culture, or at least we pretend there is with Thanksgiving and stuff like that. Right. That's yeah, kind of a whitewash, but yes, there is a lot of name. In fact, we should have a Native American cultural historian on the show. Mm -hmm. Also, do you notice he says it bird? What did he say? We birthed a nation. A nation was birthed. What is which? What is it? It's like really? Do you like? Are you trying to? 
to invoke uh, the famously racist blackface. Oh, the birth of a nation. Birth of a nation, yeah, where black uh, white actors playing black Congress people are seen in the halls of Congress eating like fried chicken with their bare feet up on the table. <laughs> So yeah. Also, you're a cat. You say that like, like, like it's not like it's true. problem. Like it's not true. Yeah. Like it's not yeah. documentary footage. Yeah. Yeah. Also, can I do this? I, I don't know if I can do this, but like he's Catholic. I don't care. But like his whole shtick, all these people he likes so much, they're a bunch of like, you know, evangelicals. Like I love the. I want. I always want to Catholic shame people who do this. Sorry, mm. Matt. I know it's triggering. No, it's all right. Yeah. But yeah, you is there you fucking Catholic? Not you, Santorum. Hmm. That's so uh, not cool. I just want to yell. I just want to mock him for his Catholicism. Not that I care, but it's just so hypocritical because all the people he's all of his political allies, they're a bunch of evangelicals. They don't like Catholics. It's funny. I actually asked him about that once. Look Uh, at that. That is why you and I were meant to do a podcast together. He was doing this thing where he it's, it's, it's actually called the full grassley where you visit every single county in Iowa. It's, it's sort of like a frat there where you got to, you got to compress as many visits as you can into a short period of time. You got to set up, set up in each place. And there's a ton of driving and you, you kind of get off and you, you do your speech, you shit, you kiss your babies, get back yeah. on the bus. And anyway, it's, it's supposed to be a big press event. And um, so I, I had to follow this guy around all day. I wow. Did guy, you like slip a, on the trail of Centaurum he left behind him? No, I didn't. He, he, yeah, he didn't leave a, a an ooze of Santorum behind him. But he he would talk about religion constantly in each one of his stops because obviously a lot of these places were rural and church going. But he never mentioned the fact that he was Catholic. And I until finally, you until you heckled him. Well, no, I finally I finally Catholic. found him. I finally got him at a moment where he was like not surrounded by AIDS in some town in Western Iowa. I forget. I wrote I wrote about this, and I asked him. Uh, how come he never mentioned his Catholicism and a couple and a couple other things like uh, something about the large number of people in the race or something like that? And he just said, well, "What happens in Iowa stays in Iowa." It was like a total non sequitur, and then he just like blew me off and walked away. So he clearly he clearly knows what he's doing, like that not mentioning Catholicism. Of I mean, course, all, right. a lot of his crowds are not aware that he's not an evangelical. So you know what he is? He, he, I mean, he, he won that caucus. It was impressive. He's a mackerel snapper. A mackerel snapper? What's Have that? you heard of that? No. It's an anti-Catholic slur. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. It refers to, you know what it refers to? What, the, the fishes, the loaves and the fishes? Yeah, that they don't eat red meat and poultry um, right. on that, what is it, on Fridays? Yeah, Good Friday. Yeah. yeah. He's a whore of Babylon. <laughs> I'm just looking at, I'm literally looking up anti-Catholic slurs on Wikipedia. I'm going to get canceled. I'm just trying to foment. I'm trying to break, I'm trying to divide and conquer the Christian hegemonic uh, right wing block. Right, right. I mean, there's plenty of right wing Catholics. I mean, yeah, Lewis, it's Lewis true, Free of course. And you know that whole Opus Dei cult that was in. Oh no, of course, but but his particular brand, right? He runs in the evangelical right wing circles. Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. all I'm saying. I'm just trying to use that against him. Yeah, no, he's he's he, what he, a papist he is. Right, he's a papist. He wasn't born again. He was, he yeah. Was, he was christened at birth, and yeah, it's all yeah. It's, the whole thing's messed up. So messed uh, up, yeah. All right, so what do we have for isn't that weird? Uh, so for isn't that weird? We all knew this would happen. Uh, carers allowed to help autistic man who quote cannot get girlfriend and quote pay for sex. A very important ruling, actually, and a lot of interesting philosophical questions are explored here. Carers for a man with a form of autism and a genetic disorder can help him pay for sex, a court ruled. The landmark decision could have major implications for the lives of many vulnerable and disabled people, although the government has been given leave to appeal. So uh, the ruling said that uh, carers, and I guess this would be what, like attendants, home attendants, Mm -hmm. um, uh, should not be prosecuted for helping certain patients with this most important sphere of human interaction. And the case revolved around a 27-year-old man granted anonymity by the courts, referred to as C, who told his care advocate he wanted to experience sex. Um, as a toddler, C was diagnosed with a genetic developmental d- disorder, Kleinfelter syndrome, which affects social interaction and physical development. Um, he was diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum and he has a wide range of interests, including sport, playing sport, listening to rap music and visiting museums. He did tell his carer 
that he he though he wanted to have a girlfriend he thought his prospects were limited quote he said that he wanted to be able to have sex and wished to know whether he could have contact with the sex worker it was obvious that he had given this issue some thought the carer raised the matter with his social worker and in due course these proceedings were commenced by the local authority to address the lawfulness of such contact so he has and he has mental health issues and he was sectioned and detained which i guess would be this is in england right so i guess that's like committed he's on antipsychotic medication he has a uh, live-in carer they will not be prosecuted according to section 39 of the soa and an offense punishable by up to 10 years in prison is committed if a care worker causes or incites a person with a mental disorder to engage in sexual activity and that was around to quote unquote protect people with mental disorder like protect those with mental disorders from having sex i guess mm. like from being abused or maybe there were issues about consent now of course that's not an issue or that's been you know the judge stated though this was undoubtedly historically motivated by a paternalistic desire to protect them it had the countervailing consequences of dismantling their autonomy and failing to respect their fundamental rights dismantling you had to use that word okay go yeah ahead. yeah dismantling yeah in this fear the legislation marks a significant shift it is no longer the objective of the law to prevent people with mental disorders from having sexual relationships rather it is to criminalize the exploitation and abuse of such adults by those with whom they are in a relationship of trust preventing this guy from legally paying for sex was ruled discrimination and and just for background i mean this should be higher up in the article for being honest um in the uk the act of paying for sex is not a crime but encouraging or facilitating sex work for example running a brothel could result in pros in oops prosecution so good for this guy good for sex workers good for a lot of things it's weird but good how is that is that a fair thing Raise, raises a bunch of questions that are a little odd right is there a punishment for somebody who isn't disabled if they do the same thing well i guess not no i mean because it um they said that's not punishable right like then why why would that such a person it's because even... it because of the old like um what oh i see it? i got, the, got I, I what's it called you. paternalistic law that made it you know obviously it existed to protect people but uh for that reason hmm. potential reason hmm. but uh yeah, so I think right, that's a good I'm thing. Yeah, I'm happy. Fine. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's all kinds of things you got to worry about there. Yeah. Right. But sex work should not be one of them. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You should be able to to communicate your desires yeah. freely and yes, without without yeah. fear of legal repercussions. Right. Yeah. Makes In fact, sense. That should be part of the health care provided. It should be a, a Medicare. The expense. government, yeah, should pay sex workers. That's actually a good idea. Well, they couldn't hear because it's illegal to do that which is a mistake big opponent mm. of that yeah it's never going to go away so just from a harm reduction perspective yeah i have very I mixed know, feelings about yeah, that because a lot of people do i think there's between trafficking and there, 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 it's like yeah but the that, worst that, businesses in the world so right but i think we can then isolate trafficking from the non-trafficking sex mm. work because one is like some people will debate, well, how much choice do you have? Sure. But we can all agree that like the choice to do it when you're not physically trafficked is a different. There's more choice. All right. Should we go to isn't, that, isn't terrible? that terrible? Yeah. So isn't that terrible? I figured we would just do I, I did a story last week, which is kind of horrible. So I figured we'd just do it. Yeah. Um, why are you underselling? Why are you selling yourself short? You're just you want to acknowledge it so people aren't like that lazy <laughs> no, I mean, it. I, I, I just it, it's not a it's not a normal like I don't know some somebody's puppy got caught on oh, fire. Got it, yeah. This is a different kind of terrible. Um, this is about a, a a financial disaster. It's kind of the sequel story to GameStop, but it got it didn't get quite as much ink, even though it's way scarier and more horrible. And it's about this dude Bill Wang, uh, who is uh, was sanctioned years ago for market manipulation, insider trading, uh, and he's nuts. And uh, he has a hedge fund called Archegos. And Archegos, uh, and people probably haven't heard this yet, basically this single individual just blew a hole in the economy that cost about $100 billion, maybe $200 billion. And uh, we're not hearing about it because I think Wall Street's kind of embarrassed about, about how this happened. Because it's, the, it's not so much what he did, it's the underlying practices that allowed this to happen that are that are so scary. But I think the, the most, the first thing you have to understand is that this guy, Bill, Bill Wang, he's, 
he's nuts and I don't know, let's, wang nuts yeah so nuts uh, and wang wang and nuts matt if we could see the clip of bill wang and it's at the two minute mark you'll start to see where his particular investment philosophy comes into play how will this company enrich people's lives LinkedIn is a company that connects people to jobs that are a good fit for them so that they can have good jobs. Do you think God would be pleased with it or not? Of course he would be pleased. It's just like what Jesus did. Jesus was sent to this world by God. And he said, I have come to do the work of my father and he did it well. He was gentle and loving in his ministry, that's culture. And finally, he invested in a lot of people and helped them grow. So ultimately, I try to invest with those, those principles. And you know up. where God and Jesus met? Where? LinkedIn. That's right. They Otherwise, they would. They just never would have made that connection, right? Right. Uh, so later on, he, he, in that in that video he made a couple of years ago for this charity, he says that he invests without fear of death or money, and that he's he has freedom that makes people on Wall Street wonder. What he did is he went to every big bank on Wall Street, and he decided to place these massive bets on nine different companies. Uh, so if, let's just say that he bet a uh, million dollars on uh, Viacom, CBS, which is one of the companies. So he would go to Goldman Sachs and he'd say, I want to bet, you know, here's here's a million dollars, but I, we, I want you to lend me another nine times that or, or seven times that so I can bet on on Viacom. So he would put put a small amount of collateral uh, and then the banks would lend him like multiple times that to buy shares in these companies. Uh, and in doing so, he ended up accumulating uh, as much as 30% ownership in like in nine enormous companies on Wall Street, which sent single-handedly sent the share prices of these companies skyrocketing. And the punchline to all of this is that each of the banks thought they were the only ones doing this. Uh, oh. But then they then they discovered at the end of March that they were all doing this. So that they had all lent him this mass, this one guy, this massive amount of money. Uh, and that that was single-handedly pushing the stock market way up because he was, and, and he never actually posted the collateral himself. So this was all money that he borrowed from the banks to, to just basically to shoot uh, Viacom from thirty-something dollars to a hundred dollars. So if you remember, if you remember all the consternation about GameStop, because GameStop went from whatever it was, $6 to $347, right? But that, but people thought that was funny because that was like ordinary people doing it. Right. Right. It was, it was, it was people on Reddit who had decided, Hey, let's just bet up this stock and see if we can mess with some hedge funds who are, who are betting against it. Um, and so they did that. This is the same thing, except it's not ordinary people on Reddit doing it. It's like one crazy uh, SEC sanctioned, uh, Jesus freak market manipulator. Um, right. And he managed somehow to hoodwink all the biggest banks on Wall Street into doing this one deal. And they they all took massive losses. Uh, Credit Suisse just, just announced like a five and a half billion dollar loss. So the, this is this is like it's the it's one of the biggest stories of this type since Bernie Madoff, but it's much bigger than Bernie Madoff. And they're being kind of quiet about it because no one knows if there are more things like that out there. Right. And if there are, you know, the stock market's been going up, obviously. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that there's just way too much money in the system um, with since the bailouts of last year and this year, the Fed is just kind of pump, pumping all this liquidity into the market. And that's allowing the banks to to do this kind of thing. So it, it, this looks like a, it, it looks like a hint that there is a kind of a massive problem with overvaluing stuff in the markets. Uh, if and when we have, you know, a, co a correction or uh, a, a stock market crash, they'll probably look back at this and say, this was a warning that, uh, that wasn't, wasn't really followed up. Right. On. So, and the, oh, and the Goldman penis envy thing. Yeah. When I, when I talked about this, one of the reasons this happens 
is because banks that aren't Goldman Sachs, when they get somebody who's crazy walking through their door saying, hey, you know what? I'd like to bet like a gazillion dollars on this company and I don't really have a whole lot of money, but can you lend me, you know, ass loads of money so that I can make this a responsible bet? They're all, they'll all do it because they desperately want to be Goldman or Morgan Stanley. So they, they outdo each other in terms of how much money they'll lend to somebody like this. Right. And I had somebody describe that as, uh, for who, who, you know, as Goldman penis envy. And so oh, they're, they're, they're all, they're all doing this, uh, because they want to, they want to be the, at the top of the market. But the result is you, you get these crazy situations. But you know, it's very much inspired. I feel like what he's doing is very much inspired by Jesus Christ. <laughs> the Big fan of, uh, of interest. Mm -hmm. Usury. Right. Usury. Yes. Usury. Because, yeah, well, like, why why wouldn't you want to go and borrow a whole bunch of money and then and then pay interest uh, to all the banks that lent you all that money, right? It's yeah, for it's Jesus. A, yeah, it's exactly like it's just exactly what I mean. I like that he he this guy openly touts and praises Jesus, and like, what better way? I'm trying to think of like a better way to do this. Like, well, yeah, I mean, actually, you bring up a good point because. You could bet on stocks without the interest, without borrowing money. Right. Uh, and he he specifically structured it this way. He's actually structured it as a swap. You know, he, he's he's leveraging his bet up over and over and over again, which requires money changing and interest as the usury aspect that probably right. Jesus, Jesus wouldn't have been a huge fan of. So yeah, we know he isn't a huge fan of it, right? Didn't yeah. he say that in one of his? Yeah, I'm not not sure that would have uh, not, not not sure that would have pleased God in the way that yeah uh, that, yeah that Wang is we should look to, we should look up on LinkedIn what if he if he has any experience in usury <laughs> in his career <laughs> yeah we'll have, have to check that out well he 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 got busted the the case that he got busted for involved investments in Chinese banks so he doesn't seem to have a problem with banks and right their users so right um, of course yeah I mean it know. did it did uh give my people a real uh niche market though yeah for a while right yeah yeah, yeah. because all of us christians we just wouldn't we wouldn't touch that whole user yeah. thing and yeah and, yeah and left. we were barred from other jobs so you know that a magical combination all power to you you yeah. know Thanks. we left yes. we, we left a market opening for you yeah yeah, yeah. In, in, in all seriousness this is this is a big story this is like i mean the, the, story, the, so yeah. the, the, the gamestop thing kind of woke up woke people up to the idea that the markets are kind of fictitious and there are these wild swings in prices that are happening because suddenly there are all kinds of actors who are involved in the market who were never involved before. Right. This, th this is different and way worse because it suggests that basically anybody, you know, anybody can walk through the door of a major bank and, and what they're basically letting them do is max out a dozen charge cards to bet on the stock market. And so there's, you see the stock market going up. The question we have to now ask is how much of that is people just maxing out their charge cards to bet on the market? It could be a lot, you know, and eventually they're going to have to pay their bills and, you know, it's a scary story. But I have a question. Was this different? Like with Madoff, Madoff like ruined the lives of a lot of regular people, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. regular wealthy people. So does this, this type of stuff happen? In this well, case? sure. It's this, in in this case, anybody who bet on any who, who bought at those right. let, let, let's say you bought Viacom at eighty when it was going up to, you know, it was on its way up to a hundred because of this guy. And let's let's say you bet a you you bought a whole bunch of that stock at eighty. By the time this whole thing came out, the stock went down to forty. All Got it. Of, so, so, yeah. so that, that's when when they're talking about how there's there's the banks the, the banks by themselves lost. Ten billion dollars. So just the people who are who who were buying securities for him lost ten billion dollars. But the other people who were invested in those stocks have what the, the estimate now is that they've lost between one hundred and two billion, two hundred billion dollars. Okay, I got it. yeah. So <laughs> and, and stocks related to those stocks. So so there's just there's lots and lots of people who've lost tons of money because of this. It's in, in fact it's it, it's worse than the Madoff thing because. The Madoff thing was 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 fairly confined to people who were invested with him. Right. But that's not the case here. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, why doesn't he ask himself what would Jesus do? WWJD and like give them back the money. He doesn't have any. That's that's the 
that's the punchline of the whole thing is that uh, right. so you, there, there are all these news stories and it's funny the Wall, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and the New York Post they're all talking about how he has a personal net worth of up to 50 billion dollars but there's never been any evidence that he actually has any money Oh. So this is again that's similar to the Madoff thing when they actually looked into the guy's books they found that he had never made a trade didn't have any cash not any cash he had some but not right. really what he was representing but the yeah the the systemic weakness here is that anybody who's invested in the stock market probably should be wondering like how much more of this bullshit is out there and like right. am I going to get hit by this too and yeah that's an issue so that's yeah. terrible that's terrible So excited to have back on the show Thomas Frank, author of many books, including The People Know, Listen Liberal, What's the Matter with Kansas. And The Conquest of Cool. And The Conquest of Cool. And he's also a contributor to The Guardian. Welcome, T Tomas. Friend of show. Thomas Friend of show. Frank. FOS, Thomas Frank. Thanks, guys. How's Thanks it going, Tom? I've got shot number two in a couple days. It will be two weeks since I got my second shot, and I will be street legal i will be you know ready to to uh, uh, commence doing all the things that i stopped doing in march go of 2020 start knocking off liquor stores again <laughs> which one moderna or pfizer uh it was <laughs> pfizer here in maryland yeah uh, and uh, of course there's a story behind the, the shot but we should uh did you have you guys got yours yes yes what are, what are, what did you get moderna moderna we had to coordinate for the show just right. Oh, right. Yeah, really? it has to match. Yeah. But you're not even in the same state, right? No, yeah, we're not. No, we're not. No. no. So I got mine here in Maryland, and it was a, a, a really interesting situation. There was this part that they shipped a whole bunch of uh, vaccine to this uh, to this part of the state that's A, very remote, B, very Republican, and C, is like a, a summer resort area, and, and it's not summertime. And so as a result, they had like this huge surplus. And the governor of Maryland went on the radio and said, OK, everybody is now this is a, like a month ago. Everybody is now eligible for to get vaccine at this place. And we just we drove over there and got it that same day. Nice. Great. Excellent. Hogan, right? Governor Hogan. Yeah, Governor Hogan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I got my second shot at a at, a, at an amusement park. There was something now this was like novelists someday should write about this, but like, um, you know, you could see the rides in the distance, you know, the roller coaster and the, right. the parking lot is all organized by names of candy bars and uh, like uh, Warner Brothers cartoon characters. You know, it's all like happy reminders of your 1960s childhood. And and you're going there because we're in the middle of a pandemic that's killed millions and millions of people. That that has kind of a Philip K. Dick feel to it a yeah. little bit. There yeah. you go. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was reading reaching for yeah, yeah. reaching um, for no the name of who which which uh, novelist would do that justice the, yeah because yeah. it's got that kind of like corporate oh my god she's yeah. did you hear the joke she just made Thank katie you. helper what did you say? reaching for the dick yeah i didn't say oh. it it was implied <laughs> yeah, that, I, she I mean, got I, close I, I, to saying it i mean i'm hearing the puns already <laughs> yeah, and yeah, i'm yeah. very punish and very <laughs> vulgar so so speaking of speaking of uh dystopian imagery mm, i've got one for you What's that? This is the Wichita Eagle building being torn down. It looks like Palestine. Wow. It's Wichita. So uh, uh, there's an artist there that I know, and he does these sort of wonderful paintings of, of scenes in Wichita, wow. Kansas. And this is the, the Wichita Eagle. I once did an interview. Is that a painting me. or a photo? It's a painting. Oh, it looks like a photo. Uh, and uh, they once interviewed me in that building after What's the Matter with Kansas came out. They didn't, wow. they didn't. They didn't like that book. <laughs> and ever since then, that is that when it started no, no, deter but it's, there's deteriorating something to, the building the, after the, that interview. Oh no, no, no! It's just uh, uh, that's just a little side Thanks note. For clarifying. But it was once a, like all of these regional papers. They had this sort of golden age in the '90s when they were, were actually quite good. And it's just like you know, it's the most awful thing in the world. Here's something my dad sent me from the Kansas City Star: a clipping. Well, it's a photocopy of their building not being torn down, but uh, being the moving their offices out of their own building, which they just built their original office building, which is this glorious, you know, structure from the turn of the last century is now, um, I think it's an apartment building, by the way, Tribune tower. It's like Chicago a massage is. envy now or something like that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. It, it's a bit like Tribune tower in Chicago is now an apartment building. Well, it's amazing because 
you know, even even when sort of you and I were coming up in the in the business, the they were all we were already starting to see like local local newspapers disappearing. So we we what well, we've lost like two thousand since two the year two thousand one or so. Yeah. But yeah. now now even the big dailies are just vanishing like one after the other, and they're being liquidated for like the iron in their printing presses. Like that's that's exactly how much they're worth. You yep. know. But no, they turn their turn their buildings their you know their real estate into it's their real estate holdings. You know. Right. The, uh, they, this by the way this happened to organized labor too that uh, they they had these fancy office buildings in Washington DC all the big unions had them and they they they've all had to you know sell them speaking you know. of media can we talk about your recent appearance on Bill Maher on real time how was it how did you like it you got oh, it was I, a viral, so I, I, it, viral it was moment. It, it, no, it was it was it was great and i you know i'm a, i'm actually a, a big fan of his there is something about his he reminds me of H.L. Mencken is what I want to say, because he's just like he, you know, his the his the scoffing, you know, and he any piety, he will go after it, you know. Yeah. And uh, uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of his. Every time I get on there, though, I'm completely tongue tied because, you know, you're faced with a guy who's ve- he's very, very, very clever. Well, and, there's also uh, no, there's no structure to the show either. Right. It's like kill or be killed. Like they don't they don't toss to you <laughs> right. in, in that show. Yeah. So yeah. you have to fight did, to get. Yeah, you did very well though. You basically mm-hmm. and you had a little disagreement over whether or not Bill Clinton moved the party to the center or to the right. You obviously were on the side of saying it was to the right. Well, yeah, um, because because what Clinton did, these are things that Reagan wanted to do. Right. Reagan, that's the definition, right? I mean, th- th- you can always fiddle around with the definitions if you want. Sure. But Cl- Clinton a- achieved. We, you know, we we don't. It's difficult for people to understand this, but the the Reagan Clinton got much more of the Reagan revolution done than Reagan himself did. The the bank deregulation it takes just a for starters. It takes yeah, it takes a Democrat. That's exactly right. Quoting he, Tom's book, Listen Liberal, yeah, where yeah, he quotes yeah. some insiders. And I, was, I was quoting, I think, Charlie Denham, who was this one of the very last really conservative Democrats. And he said, you know, you gotta have a Democrat to repeal if you want to repeal chunks of the New Deal, a Republican can't do it. It's got to be a Democrat. And that's exactly what Clinton did. All those bank deregulations, you know, one after another after another, uh, the uh, welfare reform. That's the only time anybody's repealed a part of the Social Security Act. That was Bill Clinton. And you also made another really great point. Bill Maher was saying, talking about Giuliani and saying how unprecedented this was, right? And you pointed out that it actually wasn't this kind of corruption and uh, conflict of interest. And you cited, you know, Nixon. Hey, Katie. Yeah. I have no recollection of that. Okay, <laughs> so I on. have to tell you something about a TV show like that. It's it's like a drug. And I, I often do these shows and I actually don't do them very often at all anymore for because of COVID and because I'm no longer, I'm persona non grata in this country. But when I used to do them, it's uh, you, you, I don't, I often don't remember what I say during the program. I have to be reminded. And uh, after the program, uh, what do you call it? It's like this euphoric feeling. And after oh, I, I just, I immediately wanted to start drinking. As soon as the show was over, I found myself at one point telling a complete stranger, like these intimate details about my life and my childhood. Wow. <laughs> it, it was really, really, really weird. And it went on for hours, if not days. You guys have had this experience, right? Uh, after the Bill Maher show? Or, or, or any, yeah. any, any sort of high profile show like that. I've had some weird stuff happen to me after the Bill Maher show. I ran I ran into Cornell West, who was another one of the guests in a diner after the show. We were sitting, they seated us back to back. But you guys, you don't get the 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 the, the feeling of being of being high afterwards. He's too big. No, time. no, I, I uh, he's too Hollywood. I I, 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 I plunge into remorse <laughs> after those shows usually. Oh well, that, oh, of course, right? But that's that doesn't happen to me until somebody tells me what a what a terrible uh, job I did, <laughs> and then uh-huh. it all then it all goes the other direction. Then it it goes south really fast. Well, let, let, let's bypass Giuliani for a second. Get to get to something we all want to talk about. I think. Which is this CIA recruitment video? Because I, yeah. I, I, I think this is interesting in so, a way. Okay, that- I, well, let me interrupt you. Uh, when I first saw that, I'm like, no way is that is that real? When I was 17, I quoted Zora Neale Hurston's "How It Feels to Be Colored Me" oh my in God. my college application hey, essay. Anti-communist. The line that spoke to me stated simply. 
I am not was, tragically was Neil Hurst in a comedy? There is no Andy, sorrow Andy. dammed up in my soul nor no, lurking Andy behind comedy. my eyes. I do not mind at all. At 17, I had no idea what life would bring, but Sora's sentiment articulated so beautifully how I felt as a daughter of immigrants then and now. Nothing about me was or is tragic. I am perfectly made. I can wax eloquent on complex legal issues in English while also belting Guayaquil de mis amores in Spanish. I can change a diaper with one hand and console a crying toddler with the other. I am a woman of color. I am a mom. I am a cisgender millennial who's been diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. Diagnosed I am intersectional, generalized but what? my existence what? is not anxiety a box-checking exercise. I am a walking declaration, a woman whose inflection does not rise at the end of her sentences, inflection. suggesting that a question has been asked. I did not did sneak it. into CIA. Look, it's my Brennan. My enablement was and not and Gina is Haspel. not the result of a fluke the right. or slip through the cracks. I earned my way in, and I earned my way up she the ranks it. of this organization. Like society, I am educated, qualified, and yeah. competent. And sometimes I struggle. I struggle feeling like I could do more, be more to my two sons. And I struggle leaving the office when I feel there's so much more to do. I used to struggle with imposter syndrome, but at 36, I refuse to internalize misguided patriarchal ideas of what a woman can or should imposter. be. I am tired of feeling like I'm supposed to apologize for the space I occupy you rather than intoxicate people with my effort, for the CIA. my brilliance. Intoxicate people with my effort? Me. Full stop. My parents left everything they knew and loved to expose me to opportunities they never had. Because of them, I stand here today a proud first generation Latina and officer at CIA. See, it's, it's in I slow motion the entire video. Me. I want you say to Latinx, be unapologetically you, whoever you are. Know your worth. Command your space. Command your space. Okay, also, can oh we just back God. up a couple of seconds? Okay, look at her expression. Pause it there. That does not look like she's commanding her space. If you, like, look. Doesn't that look a little, like, apologetic? Here, it, play it. It looks a little like she doesn't, she, she, she doesn't know which she, subway she, No, she looks like she's going like to, she's like, she looks like she's going to, uh, she looks like she's going to drone you, Katie Helper. I mean, I'm sure she would, and it would be an intersectional droning. And what the hell is she talking about when she goes intoxicate rather than intoxicated by my effort? She, it's she's from a, a term paper that, that somebody it's wrote. It's so bad. And it's like, she, this is, a, I mean, there's so much to unpack here. But I, first of I all. I am a woman of color. I am a cisgender millennial. I have been diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. I am intersectional. Why does she say, here's my question. Why does she say cisgender? Because. Just so that you know, you know, so that there's no, you know, mix up. I mean, it's, no, no, the question not, is, the question is, the thing is, Katie, she's that. not, it's not that she's bragging about it. She's getting the, the, the buzzword out there. That's the critical right, thing. But, so, what, so what fascinates me, uh, okay, you guys ready? Here we go. <laughs> so years ago, I wrote a book about a similar thing, The Conquest of Cool. And this is about how the advertising industry reacted to and embraced the counterculture in the 1960s and how in some ways the advertising yes. industry anticipated the counterculture. So everybody talks about co-optation, but I said like, what, what is co-optation? Like, let's, um, let's, let's take this apart. Let's figure out what this, what the mechanics of it actually are. There's huge elements of, of continuity in this culture. And I'm, I'm watching this and I'm thinking, so you guys know what, 30, 40, 50 years ago, what kind of person became a CIA officer? What kind and of I, stodgy I, old I, white man? No, Bingo. I, yeah, it, I, it, it, was, it always yeah, goes back to the- white man, no? Well, of course, well, you know, stodgy old white man, but it had to be a stodgy well, they old were white stodgy man young. From, a, from a very, yeah, well, they were Elite young in this case. Then. But yeah. they, from a certain background, had to be from, I mean, specifically had to be from Yale. Yeah, Yale, yeah, yeah. 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 Yellow when they was yeah. when the CIA was getting started, and uh, later they you know they branched out and took people from other sort of uh, uh, parts, uh, but but that educational background is absolutely uh, and utterly essential. That is the ruling class. That's who they go back to, and it's, all of this language is just these are signifiers of of you know of of that exact same uh, status, you know, right. Um, <laughs> commanding your space. Well, the CIA certainly does command their yeah, space. Yeah, it certainly don't they? does command space. I mean, and and they they are intersectional because think about the ways that they've but they, like slaughtered pe slaughtered people who were Mayan and women. 
people of color. <laughs> yes, uh, but there's always one thing left out of the intersect of the of the intersecting, and in, that, in 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 the advertising industry as well. So when you look at like Class? why did why did Madison Avenue love the counterculture? Why did they embrace this? And why did they overnight become? Uh, you know, start talking about how everybody has to be a rebel and you have to rise up against conformity. They were sell it. Right. But it's a little more than that. They're embracing a certain critique of their own uh, of capitalism. Right. They are embracing yeah. a critique of capitalism where the problem with capitalism is that it's conformist and that doesn't let you be yourself, uh, you know, and it makes you, you know, wear a gray flannel suit or whatever. They're not embracing this other critique of capitalism <laughs> that you know you guys are very familiar with the one that, that you know the socialist one right. the one that 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 actually critiques you know power and who owns and blah 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 the one that we associate with like organized labor Franklin Roosevelt although he wasn't a socialist but you know what I'm talking democratic about democratic that whole Social long critique democrat the, the, yeah. well let's I think the word is 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 populist that whole populist critique of capitalism. And that's the exact same thing exactly. that's going on here. They've mm. embraced one critique of themselves and not and not this other, right? This right. one and critique it's they're very it, comfortable right? with. But that's isn't that an uh, it's it's really telling that this critique they're very comfortable with. They don't have a problem with it. Uh, but this other critique, and you, Katie, you were you were uh, I don't know if, if the if the viewers could hear this. Katie was saying under her breath, uh, you know, she was quoting Zora Neale Hurston. At the Big anti-communist. So I did not know that. I didn't know that Zora Pretty Neale Hurston was an yeah. anti-communist. I mean, so it's to... funny because Zora Neale Hurston, though conservative, which most people don't know about. I did is, not know that. Yeah, that's, but that she is intersectional because she talks about the double burden of black women. But you don't have to be. That's just fact. That's not, you know. To me, though, Tom, I think you're right on the money. So so the, the, old, the old CIA was 100% an upper class like yeah, a social club yeah it, it was a it was a social club for a, a very specific kind of upper class person who went to a couple of schools and was raised in a certain intellectual tradition right and it was really pretty much excluded to everybody else like they they weren't right. looking for other kinds of people at one, one by the way there. i might point out especially people who have been diagnosed with anxiety exactly. disorders i mean that's, honestly that's, you need, not, that's good because you know why if you're treated for generalized anxiety disorder then you won't have like a mental breakdown when you're droning when you're droning somebody people. so yeah. you're going to drone the right yeah, person. so they're already medicated so it's a good idea the cia should actually target people who are, are on meds in, in in reality what they're what, what they're signaling is this whole affinity for like therapy culture and you know uh, my victimization and all this stuff that's it's very big in certain upper okay. class schools yeah. right yeah. It's, oh, it's, oh absolutely yep you know no, that's so that continuity is 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 precise it is exactly it's exactly it's the same thing right. But there's also this so there's this requirement for something like the CIA it's like how do you legitimate so legit it's always about the my in in my whatever I write it's always about legitimation how do you legitimate something like the CIA and what it does how do you legitimate this this like in, well I hate saying this but this imperial project of course and, why uh, it is imperial it's woke well, imperialism no, no, I get, because I I sound like a I, I I was a okay. graduate student once a but space. I hate sounding like I'm a graduate student but it is that but, what else is it. No, the, of course that's what it is. Yes, we yeah. are now. You can call it imperialism. You know, we're the shoes so of, it yeah. less, we're less following academic. in the shoes of the British Empire, and we right. are we are the empire now. Right. And uh, how do you how do you legitimate that kind of rule? And this has been a chronic problem for America because it's really contrary to the democratic tradition. We, you know, this is um, goes way back. The election of the year 1900 was fought over whether America should or should not be an imperial power, and the the pro imperialists won. This is William McKinley. He won. Uh, the yeah. the anti imperialists said no. A democracy should never be an empire, and that goes right straight through i was just i just finished reading a biography of franklin roosevelt and had a lot of emphasis on like oh, his relationship with winston churchill and the british empire was a constant source of friction roosevelt hated the british empire you know he's like you you shouldn't be you know doing this stuff you shouldn't be going wrong right back into India as soon as this war is over. And Churchill's like, that's none of your business. We are going to resume being the uh, British Empire as soon as the war is over. And Stalin was also, you know, was like, no, no fucking way. Or do you get to just have your empire back as soon as this is done? No, I mean, they're, they're, they're selling a whole generation of people on this idea that, well, there's a couple of things. Number one, in the age of Trump, 
they presented themselves as the enemies of of creeping white nationalism right that they're they're the they're the bulwark i mean there, there's even a site now that calls itself the bulwark on substack right uh that which which pitches itself as the, the, the you know we're the protectors of civil civilization against this zombie like right wing horde right but then there's this, also this idea of exporting this new kind of enlightened western culture to the rest of the world if necessary by force and we started doing that you remember when they, like they started when they called the the Kosovo war the humanitarian war that was NATO's right. NATO's PR campaign back then I think you know we're going to start. By the having... way, that was the first time NATO ever fired a shot. Really? A, yeah. They well, we never fought the Soves. Right. You know that uh, that was that it was that war. But that's but that that formulation now I think is is be, is becoming central to how they want they want young people to perceive what the CIA is like. We we, we the are arsenal of democracy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> the as, secret as he fortress. fought to make men holy, let us fight to make men free. Right. Right. The battle hymn of the republic. <laughs> Except for that, right. that, that's Jesus that they're talking about there. Obviously, right. we're not we're not doing that anymore. You know, that's <laughs> we're, we're Jesus with drones. <laughs> Yeah. Again, what would Jesus do? Drone. I mean, I think that also, Jesus drone? Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the uh, the things about it is also it's like self-preservation, right? It's like appealing to this. It's co-opting this language so that it can rebrand itself. And what's so frustrating about it, of course, is that the CIA is not as much as it likes to brand itself in this case as anti-racist, as intersectional and feminist. Like it's not just like when, when it's in the case of the CIA, it's not just like uh, a class issue, obviously there's also the aspect that like most of the people the CIA takes care of, by which I mean like what uh, kills or destabilizes their their governments are black and brown people. And like the, you know, disproportionate victims of wars are women, civilian population are women. Um, so and not, in other words, Katie, so they're directly confronting the most obvious critique of themselves. Right. They're trying to. But of course, it doesn't work because like having intersectional killers doesn't have anything to do with the background. It, of you the say people. it doesn't work. I think I, I, now that's yeah, well, no, it, say, does, like, it does work, but it's not it's illogical. It's dishonest and it's gross. But I guess I'm but, right. But the, but the domestic audience, the audience here in America, it, it I think this this it might work. The, yeah. By yeah. the way, that. Uh, no, because Tom, this, to is the, this is the con the conquest of cool, right? This is this this is what you you take a um, a population that's beginning to have thoughts in one direction, and you supply them with with a new version, right? Right, of critique. You, of it, critique. It's a, a critique that is that is uh, essentially. I don't want to say De harmless because it it's not harmless, but it, yeah, but it, right, exactly. Make sure that you rate and review us. Follow us on YouTube. Join our Substack, usefulidiots.substack.com. Subscribe for free to get the regular show and subscribe for some money to get the paywalled uh, bonus episodes, which are really good. They include extended interviews as well as bonus segments. So for this week, we have an extended interview with Thomas Frank, and we have a bonus segment where we discuss Joshua Shanks firing for exposing himself unwittingly to his staffers when he got out of a bath on a Zoom meeting, thinking that his camera was off. We have a very hot take on that, or at least I do. Matt, too, I guess. It also includes a rather graphic and disgusting discussion about some would you rathers. You can find the podcast wherever you find your podcast. And please rate and review us on iTunes. <laughs>